looking back at you know what we what we uh, talked about last week when we were actually physically in Vegas for CES. I don't know how much detail we went into the actual Vega architectural preview that they launched uh, while we were out there. Did we? Did we? Didn't really talk much about the specifics like, on it, did we? Yeah, I think we did almost none because my briefing was was taking place the next day at like eight. In the morning. Oh, okay. Um, but okay. you know, the, it's essentially they're they're saying we have a new architecture. It's built mm -hmm. around high bandwidth cache, the ability to to uh, you know. Uh, engage with up to 512 terabytes of RAM, which will make more sense uh, a little bit later in this paragraph than it will right now. Um, you know, we don't have a release date on Vega. We don't have products based on Vega. Um, you know, we right. know Vega. You know, we know they told us that Vega was running on this machine that was running Doom um, and 4K reasonably well. Um, some of the more ardent Doom enthusiasts spotted a, a little bit here and there where they would have improved it. But again, we're talking about what amounts to a freshly taped part with a new uh, architecture built around their high bandwidth cache. And it seems to be yeah. all about redesigning the memory space and the transportation of bits to and from um, the memory on there. Um, it's, 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 uh, act, it's honestly a... It's almost a fundamental recreation of the memory hierarchy in a, in a GPU, uh, if you look at it from a certain point of view. And if you look at it from a different view, it's kind of just like a renaming scheme. Um, so the high bandwidth cache, what AMD is calling the high bandwidth cache on this, is in fact just um, your frame buffer renamed, right? Uh, so. Right. In in the case of Vega 10 or the Vega product that they're that they're talking about today, that is HBM2. So uh, you know, it, it upgrade over what Fiji had and the Fury X and the Fury products. This is HBM2, so you're going to have double the bandwidth per pin. You can have significantly higher um, uh, memory capacity per stack. So there's no more uh, limitation to how much memory they can have compared to other memory technologies. So there won't be a case where you know. Uh, this part can't have 16 gigs of memory, but, you know, NVIDIA can have one on their GDDR5X parts. That won't exist again. Um, but it is kind of interesting to look at that cache as it really is just your local memory on the GPU. And in this case, it is on chip. It is HBM type stuff. But there's nothing to preclude it from or preclude them at AMD from determining that a GDDR5X implementation or G5 or any kind of DDR tech could be considered the high bandwidth cache in a lower priced part based on this same design, right? Um, you, so it sounds to me like, on one hand, this is a radical rethinking of the architecture of the GPU and how the bits are passed around inside your graphics card. And on the other hand, there's enough flexibility that the marketing team can kind of pull this blanket in whatever direction they need to uh, when it comes time to sell parts on Amazon. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's some of it, but the, what, what I think makes it, what I think it makes it more than just kind of the renaming scheme, which I think a lot of people have viewed it as, uh, is the, what they call the high bandwidth cache controller, which you might've otherwise just referred to as a memory controller on a GPU beforehand, its ability to talk to up to 512 terabytes of virtual address space and up to be able to communicate with other memory pools other than just the high bandwidth cache or frame buffer, whatever you want to call it, right? This includes the examples they give in their in their slides includes NVRAM, otherwise known as flash memory, so typical SSDs, uh, system DRAM, and network storage. Now, some of these make more sense than others for consumers or less sense for consumers. Um, like uh, my guess would be like for a typical gaming environment, High bandwidth cache of eight gigs. Maybe you get up to twelve or six, maybe you get up to sixteen in some some cases. If they want to increase their stack capacity, that's going to be all the memory somebody needs for a game, right? For The Witcher Four when it comes out, or whatever it happens to be, right? Um, but what's interesting is more in the professional and enterprise space. Um, you know, AMD announced last year a product called the Radeon Pro SSG, which was a GPU with a uh, two hundred fifty gig SSD on the card. And the GPU, through software emulation, could access that memory as if it were, or access that storage as if it were memory, kind of. Um, this integration is, is more fine-grained. It's more uh, kind of integrated into the logic of the GPU itself. So you can imagine a super high-end consumer GPU and or a professional GPU 
uh, a card that comes with eight gigs of HBM2 on it to act as the high bandwidth cache and then a 120 gig or 250 gig uh, NVMe SSD on it that now acts as uh, a another layer of cache. If you think about it, you know, it, this is, we're just going layers deeper in the stack here. And now it's up to that cache controller, that memory controller to balance what memory gets moved from the SSD to the uh, uh, local memory. And then what gets, you know, moved from your, your main drive SSD or system DRAM into the local SSD cache on the graphics card. And it really could fundamentally change how game developers work if they know they have fast access to something like 100 gigs or 200 gigs of storage um, that is significantly faster than them going through the bus accessing DRAM or accessing your hard drive or, or you know, standard OS SSD. Um, it could do really cool things. I don't think on the day Vega launches this year that some of those fundamental changes will, will already be there in games. Um, and it may take a while for the ecosystem to kind of evolve into it. But it's really cool to see uh, AMD kind of go in this route and kind of push forward the architectural advancements uh, that they have. And there's some other things in here too that we won't, we don't have to spend as much time on things like a new geometry shader um, that basically uh, a quick way of saying this is a large part of GPU rendering is figuring out which uh, triangles the player can't see or the camera can't see. And a lot of, of what happens is like culling triangles out of the way so you're not rendering more than you're supposed to render and then throw that work away. Uh, a new primitive shader basically says, hey, if we do this intelligently, if the developer uh, knows about this primitive shader, it can say, hey, here, here, here are all the ones that you can actually see. You can go ahead and ignore all the others. And it kind of skips a step and it makes the rendering process a little bit faster. That requires, again, developer intervention. It's going to require either a, a new API to exist and or developers to kind of um, take advantage of, you know, special AMD SDKs. And again, we get into the debate of if one GPU supports a feature and one doesn't, how do you decide what games are going to use it or not? Um, and that's a tough battle for, for anybody, NVIDIA or AMD, to that regard. And then they have things like a, a draw stream bidding rasterizer, which if you know anything about like the differences between mobile and des desktop kind of GPU structures, um, this is basically a tile-based renderer, which is more power efficient, more cache efficient, uh, but has some other deficiencies that are mentioned there uh, throughout the story. Um, this is still just a preview of what it is. Like we don't know clock speeds. We don't know shader counts total for the GPU. We don't know memory capacity. And obviously, as you mentioned, we don't know pricing and availability, the two most important things uh, for consumers. Um, but they're they're doing a kind of trickle release of, of information, a trickle release of data, trying to get people interested to stay interested in their product as you know, we wait two, three, four, five, six months, whatever it is before these parts come out. Um, and uh, you know, the AMD wants people to hang on for that ride and actually purchase these parts when they come out. So it's impressive to see what they have so far. Uh, and I do feel like it kind of got lost in the wash of the CES uh, onslaught of news, unfortunately. But it's, it's neat details that we have now.